Alice Miller, The Body Never Lies, The Lingering Effects of Hurtful Parenting. Alice Miller wrote about this way before others started talking about it. Never before has world-renowned psychoanalyst Alice Miller examined so persuasively the long-range consequences of childhood abuse on the body. Using the experiences of her patients along with the biographical stories of literary giants such as Virginia Woolf, Franz Kafka and Marcel Proust, Miller shows how a child's humiliation, impotence and bottled rage will manifest itself as adult illness, be it cancer, stroke or other debilitating diseases. Never one to shy away from controversy, Miller urges society as a whole to jettison itself in the fourth commandment and not to extend forgiveness to parents whose tyrannical child-rearing methods have resulted in unhappy and often ruined adult lives. So I will share a few quotes from the book. Frequently physical illnesses are the body's response to permanent disregard of its vital functions. One of our most vital functions is an ability to listen to the true story of our lives. Accordingly, the central issue in this book is the conflict between the things we feel, the things we as our bodies register and the things we think we ought to feel. So as to comply with moral norms and standards we have internalized at the very early age. It is my firm and considered opinion that one specific and extremely well-established behavior norm, the fourth commandment, frequently prevents us from admitting to our true feelings and that we pay for this compromise with various forms of physical illness. The body never lies, contains many examples that substantiate this theory. My focus, however, is not on entire biographies, but rather on the relationship between individuals and the parents who were responsible for the kind of cruelty and abuse outlined. Experience has taught me that my own body is the source of all the vital information that has enabled me to achieve greater autonomy and self-confidence. Only when I allowed myself to feel the emotions pent up for so long inside me did I start extricating myself from my own past. Genuine feelings are never the product of conscious effort. They are quite simply there. And they are there for a very good reason, even if that reason is not always apparent. I cannot force myself to love or honor my parents if my body rebels against such an endeavor for reasons that are well known to it. But if I still attempt to obey the fourth commandment, then the attempt of this will cause stress that is invariably involved when I demand the impossible of myself. This kind of stress has accompanied me almost all my life, anxious to stay in the line with the system of moral values I had accepted. I did my best to imagine good feelings, 
I did not possess, while ignoring the bad feelings I did have. My aim was to be loved as a daughter, but the effort was all in vain. In the end, I had to realize that I cannot force love to come if it is not there in the first place. On the other hand, I learned that a feeling of love will establish itself automatically. For example, love for my children or love for my friends. Since I stopped demanding that I feel such love and stop obeying the moral injunctions imposed on me. But such a sensation can happen only when I feel free and remain open and receptive to all my feelings, including the negative ones. The effects of what I've called poisonous pedagogy that we experienced as children have stunted our vitality in later life and also substantially impaired, if not entirely killed off. The feeling for who we really are, what we feel and what we need. The parenting approach known as poisonous pedagogy breeds only well-adjusted individuals who can only trust the mask they have been forced to wear because as children they lived in constant fear of punishment. I am bringing you up in the way that is best for you is the supreme principle behind this approach. If I beat you or use words to torment and humiliate you, it is all for your own good. Children have no choice. They must repress their true feelings if they have no helping witness to turn to and are helplessly exposed to their persecutors. Later, as adults lucky enough to encounter enlightened witnesses, they do have a choice. Then they can admit the truth, their truths. They can stop pitying and understanding their persecutors, stop trying to feel their unsustainable disassociated emotions, and roundly denounced the things that have been done to them. This step brings immense relief for the body. It no longer has to forcibly remind the adult self of the tragic history it went through as a child. Once the adult self has decided to find out the whole truth about itself, the body feels understood, respected and protected. People who, though they too were subjected to poisonous pedagogy, did not feel the need to achieve limitless power or to become dictators, in contrast to those power-crazed individuals, they did not direct the suppressed feelings of anger and indignation against others, but against themselves. They fell ill and developed a variety of symptoms, and many of them died at an early age. The more gifted of these individuals became writers or artists, even though they were able to point to the truth in the literature and art they produced, it was invariably a truth split off from their own lives. The price for that maneuver was illness. A research team in San Diego in the 1990s asked a total of 17,000 people with an average of age of 57 what their childhood was like and what illnesses they had suffered in the course of their lives. The study revealed that the incidence of severe 
illnesses was many times higher in people who had been abused in their childhood than in people who had grown up free of such abuse and had never been exposed to beatings meted out to them for their own good. So this study is possibly the ACE study done by Kaiser Permanente, by Feliti and Anda. And it is well known in the trauma community. But unfortunately, a lot of psychologists have not heard about the study. As weird as that is. This study draws upon numerous research results to prove beyond doubt that genetic factors in fact play a very minor role in the development of psychic disorders. Accordingly, many present-day therapies are careful to avoid the subject of childhood. True, patients are initially encouraged to admit to the strong emotions they have, but when emotions are aroused in the way they are normally accompanied by repressed memories of childhood, memories of abuse, exploitation, humiliation and hurt suffered in the first few years of life. This is something a therapist can deal with only if he has explored those avenues himself. Therapists of this kind are still rare, so what most of them offer their clients is a rehash of poisonous pedagogy. Precisely the same brand of morality that made them ill in the first place. So, um, I need to say this book was written in 2006 published and by now we have a lot of books that came out about the connection between body and trauma and also there are new approaches about body oriented psychotherapy for example Pat Ogden has developed sensory motor therapy. So I can highly recommend this book. Our minds have an innate movement toward integration and healing that may often be blocked after trauma. Releasing this drive toward well-being is a central goal of psychotherapy that enables the creation of integrated states that establish adaptive self-regulation. Pat Ogden, Trauma and the Body The central idea of interpersonal neurobiology is that integration is at the heart of well-being. Integration is the linking of differentiated elements into a functional whole. With an integrated system, our lives become flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized and stable. Without this integration, the flow of our minds moves toward rigidity or chaos. In this way, trauma can be seen to fundamentally impair integration within an individual, diet, family or community. Post-traumatic states are filled with experiences of rigidity or chaos that continue the devastation of trauma long past the initial overwhelming events. By integrating many domains of our experience, 
within a receptive form of awareness, we develop a more connected and harmonious flow in our lives. Such linkages include implicit with explicit memory, left with right hemisphere, modes of processing, and mindful awareness with bodily sensation. Pat Octon, Claire Payne et al. There's another great book, The Body Keeps the Score, by Bessel van der Kolk. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the leading persons in the field of trauma therapy. His best-selling book is translated in many languages. And I just was wondering, we both had been born around the end of the Second World War, how such traumatic happening to the whole society has been influencing us all to go to such a field. And that would be my first question. Well, for me, certainly, what I learned experientially in the Second World War and it got me, uh, was the defining question of my, of my life, my childhood. And how can people do such unspeakable things to each other? And I grew up in a religious society, religious family, where people preach love and goodness, and when you see a lot of incredible cruelty happening all, all around yourself, you know, a large second of my generation actually died at the last year of the war, hunger. Um, I didn't, but I barely survived. Uh, my father was in camp. I could come back from the camp and just go to bed. And my whole childhood was about aftermath of this people cruelty. So during this time, at the end of the war, many of the now modern techniques of trauma therapy have not been in the world. You could not read such people somehow the way we are doing yeah. it now. You are well known for combining a lot of things. Can you explain what is your approach which you are describing in your new yeah. book? So actually, what is striking about trauma is how it gets discovered and forgotten. And so actually my first opening to learning about trauma was learning about Pierre Genet, who wrote about it in the 1870s, 1880s, and had a very rich therapeutic armamentarium, and then he got moved out of the institution in 1902, and trauma therapy gets reinvented in his first world war, stopped again right after the war is over, again in the second world war, and by the time I worked for Vietnam veterans, there was no understanding about trauma whatsoever. But when we started to go to the library, we found that there was a lot of stuff before us. And so the interesting thing about trauma is that the people who suffer from it want to forget it because it's too much. And society wants to forget it because it's too much also. And so this is not a popular subject. Just like trauma to people themselves are not popular people. Uh, because they remind us about how irrational society is, and that rational solutions cannot always take care of it. But it still is up a lot of features of it. Um, and so the, the first thing that the trauma treatment is that people can tell the truth about what happened. Um, that's extremely difficult because people are filled with shame, uh, people get condemned for getting stuck in it, people say, why should you go almost alive? Why do you keep whining about the same old thing again? And so, traumatized people tend to get very isolated and locked up in their own uh, misery. And they find the company of other people who have suffered just like they do. And then they have a, get an identity of we are sufferers and then their lives take a stop. I think the most important thing is that we discovered that trauma changes the brain. And so, a lot of people still think that trauma is something that happens to you that is a story about the past. Um, but that's a story about the past. It really is the trauma is that your brain gets shaped and you see the world differently and you live in a different body in a different world. And you see things differently and it can be different. Not a human being. 
Then there is this book, The Heart of Trauma, Healing the Embodied Brain in the Context of Relationships. In response, many of our systems, largely below conscious awareness, have adaptively found ways to not feel so much. While we could call this desensitization, it is likely the product of us protectively shifting away from our right hemisphere, neural circuitry that is attuned to the present moment and to relationships as well as sensitive to suffering, toward the left that can stay more distant and analytical. McGilchrist 209 this hemisphere movement does not happen by conscious choice, but as an adaptive change guided by a sense of increasing danger. Stephen Porches 2011 It is possible that even this shift in our functioning might be considered traumatic, as in the service of emotional survival, we are drawn away from our capacity for offering and receiving compassion and connection. At the most basic and pervasive level, we shape one another's embodied brains from pre-birth and death. Cosolino 2014 and Siegel 2050 our nervous systems continually ask this question, are you with me? The answer is yes, when we are present and available to one another, without judgment or agenda in that moment. True safety, true present, true listening. Porches 2011 Social baseline theory, Bex and Cohen 2011 tells us that when we have felt sense of being accompanied, everything becomes easier and less painful, freeing our resources for relating and creating. Our primary emotional motivational systems in the midbrain are arranged so that remaining in connection is the first priority. The seminal work of Ian McGilchrist concerning our divided brains. He talks about our two hemispheres not in terms of what each does because both hemispheres fire for everything, but of how each experiences and then creates the world based on the different way each side of our brain attends and perceives. Right and left literally offer different perspectives concerning what matters and, as a result, shape the way we interact with each other, the kinds of institutions we create and what values we believe are important. And this is another excellent book by Robin Carr Morse scared sick it's in the title the role of childhood trauma and adult disease the mind body reunion when it comes to our overall health mind and body are inseparable what happens to us emotionally resonates physically ancient wisdom as far back as Aristotle recognized that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But this understanding has been lost in Western medicine, which allows specialization to define patients by their pathologies. We become cancer patients, heart patients, diabetes patients. The result of that 
is really detrimental. When diagnosed with a major disease, we enter the bowels of the speciality and may never resurface as a whole, let alone otherwise healthy person. Treatment protocols are typically designed with little or no awareness of comorbid conditions that most of us have, at least by middle age. For example, the woman being treated for breast cancer who is also being treated for high blood pressure. Patients referred to more than one specialist often find themselves with contradictory protocols. For example, tamoxifen for breast cancer contributes to weight gain, not good for the hypertensive. While family practitioners or internists or general practitioners may be willing to choreograph the stance of competing specialities, it is a rare doctor who is trained and comfortable, let alone has the time to integrate the role of relationships, stress and life history into the symptoms they are seeing. Reintegrating mind and body and viewing patients holistically is essential to improving health outcomes in Western medicine. This is precisely what many leading researchers now believe sets the stage for later disease, both physical and emotional. We are inadvertently altering the nervous systems of young human beings, almost always unknowingly, and for good, often life-saving reasons, but there are consequences in later development, which are typically disconnected from their roots in earliest experience and are often misdiagnosed. Dr. David Barker and his team at Southampton University in England have discovered that even before the fertilized egg is implanted in the uterus, the human organism is taking its cues from the environment in the mother's body. Depending on the nutritional environment on the way to the womb, Developmental decisions are set in place that render that individual more or less susceptible to heart disease and hypertension. In just six years after conception prior to implantation of the fertilized egg in the womb, crucial messages have been acquired by the zygot, then the blastocysts that direct the course of that future individual's heart health. At this remarkably early point, the critical factor is maternal nutrition. If the environment within the mother's reproductive system reflects a lack of nutrients, the fertilized egg and subsequently the fetus will slow down its rate of growth to help it survive a low nutrient environment postnatally. Scared sick in a nutshell, we are an amazing species, embodying potential that exceeds our wildest imaginings. Key to our success or failure in the human brain, plastic, resilient, powerful and vulnerable. We don't have to be survivors of trauma to be traumatized. All we have to do is to witness trauma. Most of us are based in that witnessing. Trauma generates polarities which fracture marriages, families, corporations, communities, politics. Trauma and its effects have become ubiquitous. Maternal gestational stress, insensitive child care, 
divorce, addiction, mental illness and domestic violence have turned many households into war zones, especially for the child involved. PTSD is prevalent in grade school and high school classrooms, contributing greatly to soaring rates of stress related disease, emotional, behavioral and physical. Is pervasive ignorance about babies and young children, especially as embodied in the common belief that they will get over it or won't remember. And the lack of recognition of symptoms or shock and trauma in infancy and toddlerhood. Fear experienced early and chronically triggers disease by dysregulating the HPA axis, activating the vagus nerve and catalyzing epigenetic mechanisms that facilitate the expression of genetic disease. There you have it. Excellent book. And there is the impact of early life trauma on health and disease. The hidden epidemic. Ruslenius Eric Vermetten Claire Payne. Traumatic events of the earliest years of infancy and childhood are not lost, but like a child's footprints in wet cement are often preserved lifelong. Time does not heal the wounds that occur in those earliest years. Time conceals them. They are not lost. They are embodied. The Hidden Epidemic There is in those words the obvious implication of something causing a serious and widespread threat to health and well-being, but they also offer a paradox, subtly leading us to wonder why an epidemic would be hidden and how. The impact of early life trauma on health and disease. The hidden epidemic summarizes our current approaches to understanding how we get to be the people we are. The very earliest external influences, certainly including parenting, a role of enormous power, whether by its presence, absence or dysfunctional performance. Our most common problems in biomedicine and mental health are the result of unconsciously attempted solutions to problems dating back to the earliest years, but hidden away by time, by shame, by secrecy and by social taboos against exploring certain areas of life experience. That's what Alice Miller mentioned when she said that even therapists will not really want to go there. You have to find a good therapist who has worked on childhood trauma himself or herself and knows what he or she is dealing with. It is becoming evident that traumatic life experience during childhood and adolescence are far more common than usually recognized, are complexly interrelated and are 
associated decades later in a strong and proportionate manner to outcomes that are important to medical practice, public health, and the social fabric of a nation. Biomedical researchers have helped us to recognize that childhood events, specifically abuse and emotional trauma, even in the earliest years, have profound and enduring effects on the neuroregulatory systems mediating medical illness as well as social behavior from childhood into adult life. Our understanding of the connection between emotional trauma in childhood and the pathways to biomedical and psychopathology in adulthood is still being formed as neuroscientists begin to describe the changes that take place on the molecular level as a result of events or ongoing states of life that occurred hours, months or decades earlier. And the DSM for, for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, describes to be considered a qualifying trauma, an event must meet both the objective the person experienced, witnessed, or was confronted with an event or events that involved actual or threatened death or serious injury or a threat to the physical integrity of self or others and the subjective criterion, the person's response involved intense fear, helplessness, or horror. It's a little bit more difficult to read because it's very complex, but I can highly recommend it. Then you have Deepest Well, Healing Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity. Nadine Burke Harris, she is a doctor and she talks about the ACE study. So this is a post I did a while back. A summary of books I read in 2018 when I did my research on ACE study and trauma and disease connection. So this is from The Deepest Well by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. A quote, every day in the clinic I saw the way my patient's exposure to ACEs was taking a toll on their bodies. They may have been too young for heart disease, but I could certainly see the early signs in their high rates of obesity and asthma. Along with my excitement at finding the ACE study's demonstration of links between adversity and disease came a wave of indignation. Why was I only hearing about this now? This study was clearly a game changer, yet I hadn't learned about it in med school, public health school, or even residency. Felitti and Anda published their initial ACE findings in 1998 and I didn't read them until 2008, 10 years. Well, and now it's 20 years and many people still don't know what the ACE studies is. And still this important science hadn't been translated into clinical tools I could use to improve my patient's health. How could that be possible? When I talked to Felitti years later, he mentioned attacks 
on parts of the paper by various colleagues. While Felitti and Anda successfully refuted the criticisms, the work never seemed to gain traction. In fact, it almost seemed to disappear, which is kind of crazy when you think about what the study revealed. The questionnaire collected crucial information about what Felitti and Anda termed adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Based on the prevalence of adversity, they had seen it in the obesity program. Felitti and Anda sorted their definitions of abuse, neglect and household dysfunction into 10 specific categories of ACEs. Their goal was to determine each patient's level of exposure by asking if he or she had experienced any of the 10 categories before the age of 18. 1. Emotional abuse 2. Physical abuse 3. Sexual abuse 4. Physical neglect 5. Emotional neglect 6. Substance abuse in the household by a parent 7. Mental illness in the household by parent 8. Mother treated violently 9. Divorce or parental separation 10. Criminal behavior in household Given what I'd seen in my patients and in my community, I knew in my bones that the study was dead on. It was powerful evidence of the connection that I had seen clinically but had never seen substantiated in the literature. After reading the ACE study, I was able to answer the question of whether there was medical connection between the stress of childhood abuse and neglect and the bodily changes and damage that could last a lifetime. The body senses danger and it sets off a firestorm of chemical reactions aimed to protect itself. The other important thing that the CYWA's questionnaire did was go beyond the traditional criteria developed by Felitti and Anda and asked about additional risk factors for toxic stress. We don't call them ACEs because they are not from the ACE study and we don't have the large body of population data to tell us odds of disease but our experience in Bayview told us that our patients faced other adversities than repeatedly activated their stress response system. Our research team worked actively with the community, youth and adults to learn what the great stressors were in their day-to-day -day lives. Informed by these insights, we reworked our screening tool to include other factors that we believe may also increase the risk for toxic stress. Community violence, homelessness, discrimination, foster care, bullying, repeated medical procedures or life-threatening illnesses death of caregiver, loss of caregiver due to deportation or migration, youth incarceration, and last but not least, verbal or physical violence from a romantic partner. That's a big one. We score these supplemental. But most important, the body remembers. The stress response system is a miraculous result of evolution 
that enabled our species to survive and thrive into the present. We all have a stress response system, and it is carefully calibrated and highly individualized by both genetics and early experiences. And then you have Peter Levine, who is the founder of Somatic Experience and he wrote several books Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma and then the other one I can highly recommend is Healing Trauma, a pioneer program for restoring the wisdom of your body. That's a quote from Peter Levine's other book in an unspoken voice as traumatized individuals begin to reown their sense of agency and power they gradually come to a place of self-forgiveness and self-acceptance they achieve the compassionate realization that both their immobility and their rage are a biologically driven instinctual, imperative, and not something to be ashamed of, as if it were a character deficit. They own their rage as indifferentiated power and agency, a vital life-preserving force to be harnessed and used to benefit oneself. This is a very, very, very important point here. Because to survive, we have the four responses to stress. One is fight. Another one is flight. If we can't do that, we go into freeze, play dead. Or we do the fawn response. I talked about that in the previous video. Fawn is the one you do when, for example, your dad is an alcoholic and totally unpredictable. So you can only play along in his unpredictability meaning you are never yourself you just completely tune into the behavior of the alcoholic you become co-alcoholic and the problem with that is you adapt to this kind of behavior you take it on like a cloak and this is how you walk through life in general not just with your alcoholic parent that's why it is a problem because you are not yourself you don't even know yourself because you had never a chance to get to that point so that's really important to look at those four stress responses they are natural but if they become a default mode they are very harmful to your mind and body so the goal is the physical sense of agency and power. Together, these experiences countered our feelings of overwhelming helplessness. Step by step, our bodies learned that we were not helpless victims, that we had survived our ordeals, and that we were intact and alive to the core of our beings, along with instilling active 
defensive responses, which reproduces fear, individuals learn that when they experience the physical sensation of paralysis, it is with less and less fear each time trauma loosens its grip. With such a body-based epiphany, the mind's interpretation of what happened and the meaning of it to one's life and who one is shifts profoundly. So this is what Alice Miller is talking about, restoring the wisdom of your body. You have to look at trauma or else you will have lifelong symptoms ranging from anxiety and depression to unexplained physical pain, fatigue, illness and harmful acting out behaviors. I have myself done a lot of somatic experience sessions and they really have changed and shifted a lot of things. However, I also needed to address the nutrient deficiency that was going on for decades. This is a great book about thiamine deficiency, dysautonomia and high calorie malnutrition by Derek Lonsdale and Chandler Mars. If a state of alarm existed for long enough and without respite, it doesn't seem to be illogical to contemplate that it might result in a deficit of available ATP. The location of the deficit might be related to the organ or system that is called upon most heavily and is likely to originate sensory signals or symptoms that attempt to notify the brain of the crisis that is developing. This could be a protective mechanism that results in the whole organism seeking rest or a local effect such as the sensations created in a limb after exercise. If this be true, then functional disease patterns could well be the forerunner of organ or system structural disease and would represent the clearest indication that more trouble might be ahead if the signals are ignored. We know that physical rest is not necessarily the answer, for the activated brain of insomnia could be seen as part of the energy using the fight or flight mechanism, and the de Visit continues to build up in the brain itself. The physiology of stress response is the well-known fight or flight reflex, primarily adrenergic and capable of extraordinary superhuman power. The secret of success in rescue work battle engagements or other emergency events that raise the average human being to be above average. What happens if this reflex is chronically sustained in a poorly adapted individual? We can assume that the total commitment to survival calls up every ounce of usable energy and even in the event that bioenergy regeneration proceeds during the crisis there may come a time when the use of energy stores exceeds the ability to supply it could this perhaps be what we call shock Genetic predisposition, 
coupled with high calorie malnutrition results in defective cellular energy metabolism. I think here you also can say epigenetics, meaning trauma. Some form of stress requiring an adaptive and energy consuming response may therefore initiate the first symptoms of thiamine deficiency. We have envisioned the etiology of disease by a combination of three factors genetics, stress, and nutrition. Using an idea derived from Boolean algebra, they are represented as three interlocking circles. Each etiological component for a given disease can be assessed by the size of each circle and the degree of overlap with the other two circles. Several case reports in later chapters clearly denote the fact that all three components are necessary for the expression of the disease. I agree very much with that. This was certainly the case in my body which probably was triggered by trauma but also by a very bad way of eating a lot of sugar and carbohydrates so i had to change my way of eating completely to carnivore as well as introduce thiamine in high doses and also some nootropics to help my brain catch up and I'm also taking thiamine oxidase so that the histamine bucket is not full and results in weird symptoms and migraines and I hope at some point that I can really shift everything back to health. The body cannot understand this kind of morality. It will have no truck with the fourth commandment and it cannot be fooled by words in the way the mind can. The body is the guardian of the truth, our truth, because it carries the experience of a lifetime and ensures that we can live with the truth of our organism. With the aid of physical symptoms, it forces us to engage cognitively with the truth so that we can communicate harmoniously with the child within the child who lives on inside us, the child who was once spurned, abused and humiliated.